So if you can turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, I'll be reading from the New American Standard. I hope you have your cup of coffee in hand. <clears throat> Again, uh, reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, <clears throat> we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's a mouthful. When I read through that normally, I just kind of read through it and I go, huh? Well, let's read on. But there's a lot of, of um, wonderful truth in this passage for us to believe. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 begins with, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. It begins with therefore. And as you know, anytime we have the word therefore, we see what it's there for. And so you have to go back to chapter 3 and get that whole context. I'm not going to read. Well, I will we'll read through the whole thing. And just uh, kind of comment as we go. So if you remember, the wider context of 2 Corinthians is Paul struggling with uh, some other apostles that were coming into a church he had planted and bringing in a, a false gospel, a gospel of grace and the Spirit, plus having to work under the law. And so we know that these super apostles, as, as we call them, um, were apostles who were uh, Judaizers. They were trying to bring in Grace plus law, spirit plus flesh, uh, a little bit of the new covenant mixed with a lot of the old covenant, and so on. So uh, beginning from chapter 3, verse 1, we read in 2 Corinthians, we read, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some letters of con con commendation to you or from you? You are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for us, by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ towards God, uh, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So Paul, in a sense, is defending his own apostleship by saying, look at your own lives. Look at the transformation that has happened by the Holy Spirit in your own lives. Um, we don't need uh, a letter of com commendation from others because you yourself, uh, with what the Spirit of God has written in your lives, you are our letter. And then he says this remarkable thing, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves. If you think about the context, you have these Judaizers coming in saying you got to keep part of the law or the law to, to really be holy, to really have your life together, to live the Christian life. And Paul re, uh, responds by saying, not that we are, are adequate to consider anything as coming from ourselves. In other words, there is nothing good in us that can produce the kind of life we need. And that, that's a remarkable statement. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything, anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is, is from God. Even in the midst of our virus today, our adequacy is from God. Um, and then notice what it says, who made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. So in the context, we're talking about the old covenant and the new covenant. And... Um, you can't mix the two. You either have a covenant of law by which we uh, are able to do it by the flesh, or you have the covenant of the Spirit, which is all of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit, the action of the Spirit, uh, having sin put to death by the Spirit, and so on. Then we uh, read on in verse 7, but if the ministry of death, in letters engraved on stone, speaking of the Ten Commandments, came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look in intently at the face of Moses, because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit uh, fail to be even more with glory? So what are we talking about here? We're talking about the new covenant, the ministry of the Spirit, versus the old covenant, which is uh, letters engraved on sp stones, speaking of the Ten Commandments. So we're talking about 
the Ten Commandments. We're talking about the law boiled down to its essential na nature. You shall love the Lord your God with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your mind, and so on, and love your neighbor as yourself. We're talking about all of the 613 commands that the Jewish people had deduced from the law. Um, so we're talking about that whole Old Covenant in contrast to the New Covenant. And what he's saying is the old covenant came with glory. We know that Moses, Moses' face shone with glory when he came out of the presence of God uh, from being with him. But how much more will the ministry of the Spirit be even more with glory? Verse 9, for if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more which remains is in glory. So what he's getting at is to these Corinthians who are falling sway to these super apostles who are saying you got to be keeping part of the law or all of the law, whatever they were saying, uh, at least part of it. Uh, he's saying, why go back to that? It had glory, yes. But the new covenant has so much more abounding glory, the, the glory of the spirit and the ministry of the spirit. Don't go back to the old. Stick with the new, completely with the new. Verse 12, therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened. For to this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it, because it is removed in Christ. So what he's getting at is if these Corinthians and their super apostles who are deceiving them if they are putting some part of their trust in keeping the law for whether it's for salvation, for sanctification, for redemption, whatever part of that, uh, they're, they're trying to seek uh, improvement by the law. He says a veil has come over their eyes. Uh, that, that's a shocking thing. Um, I have lived under in, in a church growing up that always uh, brought back part of the law in at least things like tithing and uh, the Ten Commandments and so on. You better be keeping the Ten Commandments. And in my life, I don't know about you, but in my life, the harder I've tried, the worse it gets. And we'll get into that. Verse 15 says, But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So the, the, the question is, is who are you going to be looking to um, for not only salvation, but for the ongoing Christian life? Are you going to be looking to sort of the Lord and Moses, the law, or are you going to be looking to uh, the Spirit and to the Lord? And then it defines who the Lord is in our context. It says, verse 17, now the Lord is a spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. And we talked about that uh, at length uh, two weeks ago, that that freedom frees us from the religion of Judaism. It frees us from the religion of having to keep the law. Uh, which we were not able to do because of our, the sinfulness of our flesh. And it has freed us to, to bring us into this dynamic relationship, this radical love affair with Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and with God the Father. Um, I liken to it, it to dancing, that the, that the Trinity dances, and, and the Trinity has invited us to join in the dance. Um, the Trinity leads, God leads, we follow. But it's this uh, dance of joy, this dance of, of intimacy and love. And, and um, it's not religion. It's this radical love affair, this radical friendship with Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 18, but we all with unveiled face. We're not like Moses with a veiled face. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And so we're seeing in, in a mirror the glory of the Lord, who is a spirit, but who is also Christ. And so. Um, well, I will let you remember back to that sermon. We won't do that one over again. But are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And, and the key to that verse is that the Spirit brings a transformation in, in our life. Not the law, neither uh, do the rules of our own making for what makes a good Christian have any import, have any influence on our being able to live a better life. It all has to do with a transformation that comes from the Spirit. Can we sow to the Spirit? Of course. Can we sow to the Spirit by reading the Bible? Of course. Can we sow to the Spirit by listening to messages and by being involved in Bible study? Of course. But the transformation, our minds are renewed 
by our exposing ourselves to truth, by reading the Bible, by hearing messages and so on. But the real transformation comes from the Holy Spirit. And we are being transferred or transformed from one degree of glory to another. Uh, oftentimes I can't see this in my own life, but I can look at Nancy who's sitting there listening to me and uh, I can see it in her life over the years. I can see it in all of your lives over the years. Some of you I've known 24 years and uh, I've seen great transformation as the Spirit uh, gets a hold of your life and transforms you from one degree of glory to another. So that's where we've been. Therefore, since we have this ministry, well, what ministry are we talking about? Um, remember, there's no chapter headings, no verse verses in the original works. And so this is a continuation of the same conversation. Therefore, since we have this ministry, if you go back to chapter 3, verse 5, we read in, in verse 5 those remarkable words again. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. That word servant is the same idea as ministry. Servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but, the, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So when it says, therefore, since we have this ministry, we're talking about a ministry that brings life. If you remember at the giving of the law, 3,000 people lost their lives. At the giving of the spirit in Acts chapter 2, after Peter preaches his wonderful sermon, 3,000 people come to uh, life in Christ. The law kills, the spirit gives life. So that's the first part of the ministry. In verse 7, but if, this, if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? And so now we know, since we, therefore, since we have this ministry, we're talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and it's going to come with glory. Thirdly, uh, in verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So therefore, since we have this ministry, since we have this transforming ministry of the Spirit that transforms our lives, he's getting at, you don't need the law. You don't need this uh, kind of, a mixture of the old covenant with the new covenant of law and grace of spirit and flesh. What you really need is the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. He has called us. It is a ministry that gives us life. It is the ministry of the spirit. And it's a ministry that transforms our life into the very image of Jesus Christ. That is incredible. Um, then we continue second Corinthians four, one, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. Now, initially, I, I would have thought the mercy that we received is at the cross and through the resurrection and so on. And certainly that is true. We have received incredible mercy, great mercy through the blood of Jesus Christ spread, uh, shed for us on the cross. But I think in the context, uh, context is king, as you've heard me say very many, many, many times. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive ministry, uh, mercy, that's that verse 5 again in chapter 3. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. And so that adequacy that we receive from God is the mercy that we've received. Um, I don't mind repeating that verse over and over again. Uh, we kind of read it and we don't really believe it, that well, I can still do something for God. I can still have my part. Not that we are adequate to consider in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. That mercy we receive continues, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. So that mercy, we, we have didn't deserve any of this, but now he has made us a minister, servants of a new covenant of the Spirit. Uh, so we've received mercy. And then it goes on, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. Uh, I can tell you in these days, it's easy to lose heart, um, not only because of the corruption that's surrounding us in the society and world, but also because of uh, this disease that is uh, 
growing in our society and around the world. It's scary times. I can't tell you that I have not been without some fear in my life. Uh, Nancy is a good stabilizer for me, reminding me um, uh, to focus on truth. And, and uh, I think the more I focus on the news, I've been watching some news again, and the more I focus on the moves, news, the more worried I get. But we do not lose heart. Why? Because if, if this Christian life is up to you or to me, we're in trouble, folks. I'm in trouble. Uh, as, as a good friend of mine uh, said, if there's a way to lose our salvation, he would find a way to do it. If there's a way to wreck this, I would find it. Uh, but I don't need to worry about that. I don't have to lose heart because it's the ministry of the Spirit. It's a ministry that comes from outside of this corrupt flesh. It's his work, not mine. And therefore, I don't have to lose heart. Whatever we face, whatever we face in life, whether it's illness or bad backs or surgery or cancer or heart disease uh, or COVID-19, we do not lose heart because the, the ongoing ministry of the Spirit, that transforming work of the Spirit continues in our life. Um, then 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I read that and I go, what does that mean? And I've gotten it wrong before. So I, I did quite a bit of study yesterday preparing for this. And it starts by saying we have, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame. To renounce something says, I'm done with it. I'm not gonna participate in it anymore. And in the context, what is he renouncing? Uh, this taking the old covenant or the new covenant and mixing it with the old, co uh, the old covenant, taking grace and mixing it with law, taking life in the spirit and mixing it with our flesh, mixing it with our effort and our corrupt flesh. And so um, he's saying, I've renounced that, that, that kind of life, that kind of self-determined life but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame. Um, I like how one uh, trans, or this is actually from a dictionary. It's the uh, Greek English lexicon of the New Testament uh, by Bauer and Gingrich. Uh, it, it says, we have renounced the things that one hides out of a sense of shame. I like that. One hides out of a sense of shame. Uh, Literally, it says the, the hidden things of shame, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame. And I, I wasn't sure what that meant until I saw it in context that when a person lives under the law, you can look really good on the outside. I remember growing up in, in a church that was at least in a, in a school at Christian Academy in Japan that was very much legalistic, very law-based, and a lot of the Ten Commandments and so on, you got to be keeping this. And what I noticed was everybody else seemed to be doing good, but I knew I wasn't doing good. I was failing miserably. But was I going to tell anybody that I was failing mis miserably? No, instead I experienced this deep shame. And the more law they give me, gave me, the more I felt shame because I knew I wasn't able to keep it. I was failing every day at keeping the law, at keeping at least some part of the law. Even the tithe does that to us. You better be giving 10% of your income because, but that's part of the law, isn't it? Uh, we say it's in the New Testament because it's in Matthew and Mark, um, where he says you tithe of your dill and cumin, but you have uh, neglected the weightier things of, of the law, mercy and justice and so on. But that's, again, spoken to people still living under the law. After the cross, the tithe is only mentioned in Hebrews, and it's speaking of a very um, peculiar thing, so we won't go there. But the New Testament principle on, on tithing or on giving, is give out of a joyful heart. Give what the Holy Spirit leads you to give. And it might be more than 10%. It might be less than 10%. But it, I, I say give up to your joy. Give up to your joy. Um, and so that's one aspect. That's one uh, example of how we can introduce the law into our um, present uh, living. Uh, but so you have these things hidden because of shame. When you, I used to be ashamed because I wasn't giving enough of my money. I used to be ashamed because I wasn't supposed to be lust, lusting after women, uh, according to Matthew 5. It says, Jesus says, you've heard it written, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who's look, looked at a woman and committed or with lust in his heart has committed adultery in his heart. 
And I would say the same is true for you women, right? If any of you have looked after another man or in our day, another woman and so on, with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery or other sins in your heart. And so um, it's interesting that Paul himself was, was a Pharisee. And so he had grown up. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, as to the law found blameless. And so if you turn to Matthew chapter 16, verses 5 through 12, Matthew chapter 16, 5 through 12, or you can just uh, listen along. This is uh, when Jesus says some rather uh, surprising words about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were men in that society who were considered the best of the best. They were the ones who were really dedicated to keeping the law, to following every jot uh, and tittle of the law. And when the society, when the average person in that society wanted to see a righteous person, they would direct your attention to a Pharisee. That was, what it, that was it. If you wanted righteousness, look at a Pharisee. So we find in Matthew 16, verses 5 through 12, And the disciples came to the other side of the sea, but they had forgotten to bring any bread. And this is, uh, you know, after the feeding of the 4,000 and feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They began to discuss this among themselves, saying, He said that because we did not have, He said that because we did not bring any bread. They're always missing the point. Sometimes we always miss the point too. But Jesus, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? I love it. He calls them you men of little faith. Right? Uh, that's one word, little faith. Uh, it was his, one of his pet names for the disciple. And I stand in a good standing along with the disciples, being a man of little faith. You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets full you picked up, which was 12? Or the seven loaves that you do not understand, or, or the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large basketfuls you picked up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What was the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? They taught that you had to keep the law, and then they had surrounded the law with all their fence rules, all of their own rules, to make sure we wouldn't even get close to keeping the law or to breaking the law. Uh, that was a faux pas there, but... Uh, I think our churches do the same thing. We come up with all these rules of our own making, the commandments and teachings of men, to keep us living the Christian life sort of like right, but they have no value, we'll find out, in restraining uh, sensual indulgence or helping us to live the, the authentic life. Um, when I was at uh, Vandy Camp's Dutch Bakery in Seattle working as a janitor, I cleaned uh, several areas. I cleaned the, the dough room upstairs I would, I would come at about 2.33 in the afternoon, and I would start on the first mixer. I'd actually have to climb into it because it was so large. I'd use a big paint scraper and scrape all the dried-on dough off and off of all the bars in the back and the sides. And then I would take a, a green pad and wash the whole thing down, uh, get it all clean, rinsed out, and then I would spray it with grease, move on to the second one. There were four of them. I would do the same thing. By the time I got to the third one, the baker was already using the fourth one. By the time I got to the last one, he was on the third one. It was very discouraging because I never got to see them all clean at once. But um, they had these huge troughs to put the dough in. And they would have a 400-pound dough, and they would use a bit of dough with leaven in it about the size of your fist for a 400-pound dough. In that trough, it was about um, a good three feet uh, high and about two feet wide and probably about 12 feet long, those troughs were. They were very large. They would That 400-pound dough would fill the bottom of it about this much. And then as that leaven worked in the dough, by the time they would, uh, it would be ready to put down the chute to be cut into the little pieces that would make the various kinds of breads and so on, um, it had filled that entire trough. When I was cleaning downstairs in the bread area where that, that dough actually came down and they uh, split it into little pieces, um, they had a big 55-gallon drum there on a little uh, dolly so they could roll it around. And they would 
kind of basketball shoot dough, little pieces of dough that had dropped on the floor into that all day long. Well, that dough would expand. And by the time I got there uh, in the afternoon, it would be overflowing um, six feet in any, every direction. It looked like a monster. And I would have to go and pick up that dough and punch it down and put it all back in the 55 gallon drum until I could get it all in there. It'd take me probably 40, maybe 30 minutes to get that all in there. Then I would wheel it down to the big dumpster and dump it in. The dumpster was incredible because as that dough would continue to rise, it would come out all the seams. And so the dumpster looked like a wild living thing. So what he's getting at, leaven, when you put it in dough, it expands greatly. And when you have false teaching, when you have commandments and teachings of men added in to the pure gospel of the Holy Spirit, the pure gospel of grace, it expands and it corrupts, it changes the gospel. It changes that life-giving gospel. Uh, in Matthew 23, 27, I'll just read this one to you. Again, remember, Paul was a Pharisee. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That would have been a shock to the Jewish person of the, of the day. They did not see these men at, as hypocrites. Um, For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of men's bones and of full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. And so we said, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame. So people who are living under the law, such as the Pharisees, as they try to keep the law, they keep the sin in their life hidden in, internally. They can't let other people see uh, the reality of their lives. They can't be honest about what's on the inside. And so Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs. You're full of dead men's bones. You're full of death and corruption and all uncleanliness. So I've always said that anywhere you have legalism, whether it's keeping uh, the law, whether that's been added into the gospel, or um, whether it's our, our own fence rules that we've made up uh, as, as churches, you're also going to find a lot of sin under the covers, pun intended. Um, in Romans, it says a very interesting about, thing about the law, which will uncover the, these hidden things of shame. In Romans 3.20, we read, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Get that, no flesh will be justified by the works of the law in his sight, in, in the sight of God. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. For the first, so one of the aspects of what the law does for us, it's, it's, it's needed, it shows us our sin. It reveals our sin. Ooh. Romans 5.20 says the law came in so that the transgression would increase. So where you have law, transgression, which is breaking the law, uh, in, uh, in, incidents of breaking the law are transgressions. That transgression would increase. And my proverbial, as you heard many, many times, uh, illustration of this is the speed limit sign. Speed limit sign is up there and transgressions in increases, not because of anything wrong with that speed limit sign, not because there's anything God, wrong with God's law, but it's because it's wrong with us, our flesh. We rise up to the occasion. Don't touch, I want to touch. Romans 7, 5. And Romans 7 really gets at this whole uh, idea of the things hidden because of shame. Verse 5 says, For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of the body to bear the fruit of death. The sinful passions, our sinful flesh, the passions of our flesh, that desire to do the wrong things, including the sexually wrong things, uh, which were aroused by the law. So they, without the law, some of that stuff just lies sleeping. It doesn't uh, arise in our life. But along comes God's good law, and our flesh goes, oh, yeah, I, I, ooh, ooh, I, I could be doing that. And it arouses sinful passions. Anything wrong with the law? May it never be. It's wrong with us. So you have knowledge of sin. Uh, the law gives knowledge of sin. You have the law making transgressions increase. You have the law arousing uh, our, our sinful passions. And then uh, verses 9 and 10 of Romans 7, I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, 
proved to result in death for me. Wow. The Ten Commandments, because of our sinful flesh, it becomes a sentence of death on my life and your life. Uh, it kills. The law kills. The Spirit gives life. Romans 7, verses 12 through 13. We'll see one more thing. So then the law is holy and the commandment is, is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin. I can't blame the law for killing me. It was my own fault. It was your own fault uh, for um, going beyond, for transgressing the boundaries of the law. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin affecting my death through that which is good. So that through the commandments, sin would become utterly sinful. So the law does a, a fifth thing. It commends, commends us or condemns us to death. It arouses the sinful passions in us. It uh, causes transgressions to increase. And it shows us, it gives us the knowledge of sin. But it actually makes our sin utterly sinful. We go for it. We go to the bitter end in rebellion against the law. I've lived that in my life in my early days. I know what it means to become utterly sinful. I don't recommend it. It's, but in a sense, we've all been there, haven't we, uh, in different ways. And then um, we'll conclude in Romans just with these verses, 14 and following through 25. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what, I'm, what I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do. Remember, this is Paul the Pharisee who's saying this, who knew intimately trying to keep every jot and tittle of the law. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I am practicing, what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer... Am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me? For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Sound familiar? Not that we are adequate to consider anything as coming from, from ourselves. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Have you ever faced that? Wanting to do the, the right thing? Wanting to not lust after women or men? Not wanting to... Uh, call a, a person a jerk when you're out driving or in the store or whatever, and then you do the very thing you, you don't want to do. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. want. I think we've all lived this in our experience. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. He personalizes sin. I find that the principle then that the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully confer with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free of, the, of this death? Or who will set me free from the body of this death? Remember, Paul is a, Paul is a Pharisee. He knows intimately keeping the law. And this is his description of what it was like to live under the law. Uh, if you don't believe me, check uh, Romans 7, uh, verse 1. We won't go there now. His answer, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. I love Romans 12, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hear, hear this. Old covenant condemnation under the law, this uh, living hell of having to try to do the right thing, but always doing the wrong thing, and living with that hidden shame, because we're not going to let anybody know, else know that we are living in this con constant conflict between wanting to do good and ending up doing uh, the evil that I don't want to do. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The new covenant brings a life of peace, a life of no condemnation. If you continue to read in, in chapter 8 of Romans, you'll see the ministry of the Spirit, the same thing we're talking about in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. And then one other, uh, one other couple uh, texts to kind of really flesh this out to uh, let you know what, what it means um, to renounce the things hidden because of shame. Take a look at Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. 
give you a minute to get there. Again, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. It says, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink, things of the law, or in respect to a festival, things of the law, or a new moon or a Sabbath day. All those were parts of the law, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So in other words, the old covenant was a shadow. The real thing is in Christ and the new covenant. Um, he's talking about the law there, not human teaching, not human commandments. Then jump down to verse uh, chapter 2, verse 20 in Colossians. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, he's speaking the law there. I, I can develop an argument to show you that, but I don't have time right now. So we'll have to just, you'll have to just trust me that that's, he's talking about the law. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourselves to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. Now he's gotten to the fence laws. We have the actual law with its um, declaration of Sabbaths and new moons and, and so on. And I would say the entirety of the law, but then we surround it with our, the Pharisees had surrounded it with all of their laws. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And we have done the same thing in our churches. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And a whole host of other rules that we uh, give to people, which are commandments and teachings of men. When I hear sermons, uh, I always ask myself, am I hearing uh, God? Am I hearing God the Father? Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit? Or am I hearing them giving me the commandments and teachings of men? They've started with scripture. Now they're going to give me their own commandment. This is what you got to do. Um, I, I think um, it's so easy for me even, not even, for me to bring in those commandments and teachings of men. I've done it in my ministry and the Lord corrected me. Um, I heard a really good sermon uh, by Dick Luco uh, 23, 24 years ago out at one of the um, pastor's retreats out at Cascade Camp. And essentially the sermon said, who is the hero of the sermon? You, the pastor, or God? Whether it be God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, or the Holy Spirit, or all three in one. Uh, who is the hero of the sermon? If it's a human being, it's not the gospel. If God is a hero, listen to it. It's the gospel. So um, if you get, get the passages in Romans and in Colossians, what it's getting at is all of these laws that we come up with, this, the Corinthians were being uh, subjected to a gospel that said, okay, we have the gospel. Now you got to add in a lot of law. And Paul comes along and says, none of that has any ability to restrain sensual indulgence. In other words, it doesn't transform the core of your life. You're left with dead men's bones. You're left with uh, all manner of corruption on the inside. And of course, we're not going to share that. So we're going to live a life of inward shame. I grew up living a life of inward shame. Because of the gospel, I'm no longer a man of shame. I am a man who lives in peace because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, because of the eternal hope that we have of everlasting life, of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord because of what he did. Um, so um, how do you want to live? Do you want to live according to the new covenant with a lot of the old covenant added in? Then you will be living a life with things hidden because of shame. Or do you want to live by the new covenant where the spirit transforms my life from one degree of glory to another? And yes, we still sow to the Spirit but um, by reading the Bible and so on. But it's never a should, if you will. It's um, like eating bread and, and drinking uh, a nice tall beverage, cold beverage on a hot summer day. I, I long to hear truth in, uh, in my spirit. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame. Not walking in craftiness, back to 2 Corinthians 4.2, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame not walking in craftiness. This word means uh, cunning, craftiness, trickery. Literally, the readiness to do anything to get something done. 
I'll do anything to live a righteous life, or I'll do anything to keep uh, us living by the law, I think, in the context. It's used other, two other places in um, the New Testament in this, in this aspect. Once in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, later in, the, in, the, in our uh, book, and he says this, Paul says, uh, says this, but I'm afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. One thing necessary, Jesus Christ. Uh, how did Satan deceive Eve? God had told them, you, not, you, may, not eat, you may eat of any tree in, in the garden, but you may not eat of the one tree in the center of the garden, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan comes along and he says, did God really say that you may not eat from any tree of the garden? He's changed it. He's, he's uh, trickery. He's used uh, craftiness and cunning to, to distort it, to add in something. And then Eve responds by saying, God told us we can meet, eat of any tree uh, uh, of the garden except for the tree which is in the center of the garden. We may not eat of it, and we may not touch it. Well, God didn't say touch it. So now she's added something in as well. And so now Satan has got her on the road to deception. Of course, Adam is standing idly by, listening to all, all this, doesn't do anything. So get this, it's to do with our minds, uh, not walking in craftiness. The Corinthian church had been uh, following the gospel, and along came these super apostles with the law, and started uh, convincing them that they had to go back to parts of the old covenant to live a righteous life and to be acceptable to God. Um, it's trickery. It's, it's cunning deceit. Uh, again, it's found in Ephesians 4.14, that same word, another work of Paul. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried away by every wind of doctrine, by every wind of doctrine. So it's every wind of teaching, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. So again, along comes the doctrine that twists uh, scripture, taking one verse out of context, uh, ignoring the context of the larger work or the larger uh, witness of the New Testament and the uh, larger witness of the Old Testament and so on. Uh, and again, it has to do with we are carried away by teaching and it's influencing our mind. The, second, the Corinthians were, again, deceived into believing that they had to keep some form of the law in order to live a righteous life. And then it continues in, in verse 2, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God. Uh, the, the word adulterate there, it uh, may be um, translated in various, uh, with various uh, words in our English language. It means to make false through deception or distortion, to falsify or adulterate, to add something in. So if you think about in a court of law, if somebody is lying, they're adding something into the truth or taking something away from the truth. It's adulterating. It's mixing. And so what they're saying is the word of God, which is not, they're not talking about the Old, uh, Old Testament scriptures here. If we read on, we'll, we know that, they're talk, that Paul is talking about the gospel, the gospel of grace, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel which leads us to life in the spirit. They're adulterating that gospel. They're mixing something in. They're mixing in leaven the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of the Judaizers, the leaven of the false teachers, the leaven of the preachers who want to mix in some form of law or some form of their own rules and commandments into the pure gospel. Um, I don't want an adulterated gospel. I want a pure gospel because that's the gospel that can transform my life and your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in contrast to this, he says, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God. But by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. By the manifestation of the truth, it means a public dis disclosure or announcement. I love that dictionary again. It says the open, open proclamation of the truth. So as Paul preaches the gospel in wherever he goes, he wants it to be, it's the same word we get revelation from and the verb to reveal, uh, that sense of the Holy Spirit opening our eyes and revealing the truth. But by that open proclamation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I've always maintained that when you hear truth, 
there's a click in your spirit. There's a click in your conscience that says, this is true. When I hear law, it brings this vague sense of guilt. When I hear legalism, it, it brings this vague sense of guilt. How many times have you been in, in a church somewhere, or I've been in a church somewhere, where I was living in misery because I knew what was going on in my life, the secret places of my life, the hidden things of shame. But you look around, and everybody else seems to be doing just fine. But the reality is they're all sitting in the, the hidden things of shame because the law brings that knowledge of sin, that increase of transgression and so on. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So what Paul is getting at is he has nothing to be ashamed about in, in, in his proclamation of the gospel which is the gospel of the Holy Spirit transforming your life from one degree of glory to another. And then verse 3 says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Uh, sometimes we separate this verse off from the context, and we lose its uh, incredible impact of what it means. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 16, 14 through 16, if we go back to the last chapter, we read, but their minds were hardened for until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant. The same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. You can't be looking at the Lord and the law. You can't be looking at the Lord and the law at the same time. Either you're devoted to the Lord or you're devoted to kind of this mixture, but it's really being devoted to the law. And what Paul is saying, if that's the case, the gospel is veiled to these people. It is veiled to those who are perishing. So this gospel of the grace of God, the new covenant, the ministry of the Spirit, the, uh, which has made us adequate to be ministers of a new covenant, this gospel which transforms our life by the power of the Holy Spirit from one degree of glory to another. If you add in law to that, if you add in law to, for instance, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life or everlasting life. If you add in law into that, uh, apart from that pure faith, you end up not bringing a gospel that will save people, not ending, not bringing a gospel that will result in eternal life. You will be bringing a, a gospel that, that veils people, that keeps people blinded. It is veiled to those who are perishing, who are being destroyed, whose lives are being destroyed by the corruption of their sin. And in verse 4, in whose case the God of this world who are we talking about? The God of this world? Well, we know in Ephesians chapter 2, near the beginning of the chapter, it says the prince of the power of the air, talking about Satan. So we know that the God of this world is Satan. When um, Satan offered Jesus all the kingdom kingdoms of the world, Jesus didn't argue with him. Uh, Satan was saying, I'm God of this world. In whose case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so these people who are living with this corrupt gospel, Satan is the one who is blinding their minds by thinking that they are acceptable, acceptable by keeping some or all of the law or all of our own rules. I remember growing up in church where you had to attend church every Sunday and we had those perfect attendance pins. Of course, as I've said before, I, I, um, as a pastor's kid, I had access to the Sunday school office and I got the pins out of the office and stole the pins and I could wear my uh, perfect attendance pins for up to six years. That was really good. Perfect attendance, but I had stolen. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel. Not the light of the gospel plus law. Not the light of the gospel plus our, plus our flesh. Not the light of the gospel plus the old covenant. But the light of the new covenant, the light of the gospel of grace, the light of the gospel of the Holy Spirit, the, the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it says the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. As we have seen many times before, what is the glory of Christ? The cross. And so the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ is that glory that we see in the face of Jesus as he 
said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As he gave up his spirit, shouted out with a loud voice, bowed his head, and gave up his spirit that we might have life, that we might be forgiven. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So Christ, when you see Christ, you see the exact representation of God in the mystery of the Trinity. So putting all this together then, if we go back to the, uh, let me get up to the whole text. In, in, here we go right here. Let me just read it one more time. Therefore, since we have this ministry, the ministry of the Spirit, as we receive uh, mercy in being not adequate, but being made adequate to be servants of a new covenant, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame. We have renounced this life living, uh, live, lived under the law that produces this internal life of shame, not walking in craftiness, trying to fit in law with grace and the new covenant with the old covenant, life in the spirit with life in the flesh. But by manifest, uh, not adulterating the word, not putting them together, not mixing in law with, with the gospel, by, but by the manifestation of truth, truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So what does this have to go do with COVID-19? Well, it has everything to do with it in the sense that the Holy Spirit continues to transform your life and my life. He is at work even now through this crisis, working in us, that transforming power that brings me from one degree of glory to another and from one degree of faith to another. Every moment that we have is an opportunity to trust God. This moment, this time in our life in the United States and around the world is an is a opportunity for us to trust God not to look at the news, not to look at the uh, fear-mongering that's on, uh, on the web, or not to fall into a panic and hoard toilet paper and all those things people are doing, but to look to Jesus Christ and trust him. And at the same time, it's an opportunity for us to help other people learn to how to put their trust in God, how to come to faith in Christ, how to uh, find that peace that we have, even in the midst of this tumult we find ourselves in. So for... For today, remember one thing. The Holy Spirit has brought you into a life of freedom. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, as beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed from one degree of glory to another into his likeness, into the likeness of Christ. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. For this transformed life, comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Is he transforming your life even today? Amen. Can we pray for those who are blinded, that, that uh, the God of this world will be uh, bound from blinding those who uh, don't know him, who are unbelieving? Of course. And I think that's another opportunity we have today, is to be uh, praying for those who are so frightened by this, that they might come to know Jesus Christ.